Now we can start the design part. As first thing, we have to introduce the resource manager. What is a resource manager? As the name suggests, resource manager handles resources in such a way to simplify some very complex tasks. In our particular case, we want to handle resources like textures. In the next future, we will want to handle other kind of resources, like static meshes, materials, and so on. These particular resources have something in common. They are all in some way stored in suitable files. So far, we have had to deal with resources like vertex buffer, index buffer, and in general, all the resources created by the render system. These kind of resources, unlike the previous ones, have not a file counterpart. For this reason, it wasn't necessary to handle them in a more complex way than the deallocation. At this point, why do we need a resource manager to handle resources stored in files? There are a lot of reasons, but the most important one is to give the user the ability to load in memory the requested resource by providing its file path and retrieve the reference to the same exact resource if the same file path is provided without reload or recreate it. This approach can be achieved by using a very important container, the map, where the key will be the file path to the resource and the value will be the reference to that resource, that is simply a smart pointer. Here is important to distinguish the map and the unordered map. We use map when we want to have our elements ordered in some way, that requires a bit of overhead not necessary in our case. For this reason, we will use the unordered map. Let's start the design of our resource manager. The main protagonists here are the resource manager and resource classes. The resource manager will contain zero or more resources by means of the unordered map. It will create or retrieve resources by using a suitable method that we will call simply create resource from file. The resource class will contain a stream with the file path where it comes from. We will use white char strings in order to support Unicode characters and so file path composed by characters of any languages. Very well, but we haven't talked about textures yet. At this point, what do we have to do? We need to create two other classes, Texture Manager and Texter. Texture Manager will inherit Resource Manager and in the same way Texture will inherit Resource. The problem now is where do we actually instantiate our texture? There are many approaches to solve it. Today we will use the approach based on the usage of a pure virtual method that we will insert in the resource manager and we will call simply create resource from file concrete. This method is abstract and it is concretized only when a concrete resource needs to be instantiated. In our case, Today we want to instantiate a concrete resource that is the texture. This abstract method will be used in the create resource from file in order to separate the task of management of the resources that is in general the same for all kind of resources from the one in which we will actually instantiate the resource. So far so good. The next important step is to load our images from files process them and create their texture's counterpart. We will accomplish this by using a very important LPAR library called DirectX Text. This library will help us with very few functions to do all of these very complex tasks that we will call in the constructor method of the texture class. Very, very well, now we can start to apply the texture over the surface of our 3D cube. As a first thing, we have to talk about texture mapping. What is texture mapping? Texture mapping is a process that maps the pixels from a texture to a 3D model. The mapping of pixels over a 3D surface happens in a particular space that is called texture space. 
Texture space is a b-dimensional space with two main axes. The one along the width is called u and the one along the height is called b. The position of the origin is based on the convention used by the graphics API in use. In Dart X is at the top left and OpenGL instead is at the bottom left. So we will use the top left one. The range of values of this space goes from 0 to 1. We can even go over this range, and in that case we will have simply a repetition of the same texture. The coordinates in the space, composed by the u and b values, are commonly called texture coordinates. Very well, but now how can we effectively apply this texture mapping over our 3D model? Well, generally this is done in 3D offering tools like Blender, 3D Max, and so on, for very complex 3D objects. But since we are dealing with a very simple object like a cube, we can do this on our own to better understand how this can be accomplished. Let's see this image. Here we have our cube. Our goal is to apply a texture to each face that can be whatever we want. Today we will use a texture that represents a boot box. Let's take this face for example. This face has these four vertices. For each of these vertices we have to introduce a texture coordinate. But now a question comes spontaneously. What will be the values to use for these texture coordinates? Let's see this image. Our goal is to apply the texture over, for example, the front face in this way. Since we know how the texture space works, this can help us to define the texture coordinates to apply to each vertex of this face. For example, the texture space origin corresponds to this vertex, the top right coordinates instead corresponds to this other vertex, and so on in this way. Very well, we have just mapped our texture over a 3D surface. We will use this exactly method to map the other five faces of our cube. Well, in order to map a texture over our 3D cube, we need to change the data structure of the vertices of our model that we have called vertex. Previously we have added a position attribute with other two colors attribute. Today we will substitute the color attributes with a texture coordinate that will be simply a 2D vector. Very well. The last time we have created a list of eight vertices, one for each vertex that compose our cube. But unfortunately we can't use this list anymore because of the introduce of texture coordinates. Let's see this image. Here we are seeing three faces of our cube. Let's take this vertex. This vertex is placed in only one position. But for the same position we have three different texture coordinates. One from the front face, another one from the left face and the last one from the top face. This implies a duplication of this vertex with the same position multiple times. In order to simplify the management of data vertices, we will introduce two more lists, one of vector 3D elements for the positions and the other one of vector 2D for the texture coordinates. The third list would be simply a composition of vertex elements that in turn will be composed using the elements of the two previous lists. As final step, we will declare a texture 2D object in our pixel shader, and in the pixel shader main function we will return one of its pixels by using this particular instruction, where we will pass the texture coordinate from which we retrieve our pixel. Very well, now we can start the implementation. As first thing, let's add a new feature in Graphics Engine. 
uh, let's call it resource manager. Now we can create two new classes called resource manager and resource. Very well, let's go to resource manager class and let's add an unordered map. Let's define as key the W string, the wide char variation of string. For the value, we have to define the smart pointer for the resource. So let's go to prerequisites header file. Let's define a new type called resource pointer that is a shared pointer with type resource. Let's come back to resource manager and let's insert resource pointer as value. Good, now we have to add a new method called create resource from file that returns a resource pointer. Let's add a string as parameter that represents the file path of the resource. So good, now let's start to implement it. The first thing to do is to transform the past file path that can be both absolute or relative to absolute. This will ensure us to have always a unique key for each resource. To do this, we will use a C17 function called file system absolute. Now here, we have to find the just transformed path in our unordered map. If we don't find it, this means that we have to create or allocate it for the first time. To do this, let's go back to resource manager header file and let's add a pure virtual method called create resource from file concrete. This method will be concretized nextly by the texture manager to allocate the texture resource. For now, it's enough in this way. Let's come back to C file and let's call it. This function will return as a row pointer to our new resource. If the process has gone fine, the pointer won't be null. 
In that case, let's say it in our another map in the form of shield pointer. Otherwise, we will simply return a null pointer. Now, we can go to resource header file. And here, let's add a wString attribute and let's call it full path. Let's add it even as parameter in the constructor. At this point, we can start to create our texture manager. So let's add a new filter and let's call it texture manager. Now we can create two new classes called texture manager and texture. Now let's go to Texture Manager class and let's inherit Resource Manager. The only method to concretize here is the create resource from file concrete. So let's implement it. Let's go to Texture and let's inherit Resource. Let's add the path string as we have done in the Resource. Very well, now it's a time to link DirectX text library to our project. So let's go to DirectX game and let's go to properties. At this point, let's click to BC++ directories and let's add to include directories the path to DirectX text lib. Let's do the same thing in library directories. At this point, we have to go to linker, input, and in additional dependencies, let's add the static library called directxd.lib. Let's click to OK. Very well, now DirectX text is ready to be used. Let's go to Texture C++ file and here let's include DirectX text header file. In the constructor method, 
let's add a new object of type scratch image. This object will contain the image data. Now we have to call an important function called load from WEC file that, as the name suggests, can parse many types of images like PNG, JPG and so on and load them in memory. If the loading of the image available at the past file path hasn't been successful, we throw an exception. Otherwise, we can create the texture resource by calling the createTexture function. This function requires a bit of parameters. The first one is the DirectX device. To access it, we have to make texture a friend class of render system. So let's do it. At this point, let's come back to Texture C++ file and here let's retrieve the device. The next parameters are all available inside the image data object. The last parameter is the output, where the pointer to the DirectX texture will be placed. Let's add it as a new attribute of our texture class. So far, so good. The next thing to do is to go back to Texture Manager and implement the creator resource from Fight Concrete method. Here we have to simply instantiate the Texture class and try catch it if an exception is thrown. 
At the end, let's return the text variable. Since we don't want the user can access this method, let's, let's make it protected. Now we can define a new type in the prerequisites header file called the texture pointer, that is the smart pointer for texture. Let's turn back to Texture Manager and now we can create an utility method called Create Texture from File that is exactly the same as Create a Resource from File but returns specifically the Texture Pointer instead of a generic Resource Pointer. In order to add a cast between two shared pointers, let's use the static pointer cast method. Now Texture Manager is ready. The next step to do is to instantiate our Texture Manager from Graphics Engine class. As for a spin, let's add a new pointer attribute called Texture Manager. And as last thing, let's add a new method called getTexturManager. In the getTexturManager, we will simply return the textManager attribute. At this point, let's allocate our manager in the constructor method. Since Texture Manager depends on the render system, the first must be allocated after the second in this way. For the same reason, in the destructor method, let's deallocate Texture Manager before the render system. Very well. Now we can go to app window and in on create method let's retrieve our texture manager and let's call create texture from file. And let's path the file path to our boot image. Let's see if it works. <laughs> 
It seems to work. Unfortunately, here seems that some libraries haven't been unloaded. That means that some resources haven't been released. Let's turn back to Taxer. Indeed, we have missed to call the release method from Taxer in the destructor method. And in order to call the destructor method of a derived class like Taxter, it is necessary to add the virtual keyboard beside the destructor of the resource class, that is the base class. So good, let's try it out. And it works. The libraries have been released. The next important step is to apply texture mapping to our cube. As first thing, let's go to vertex buffer and let's change the input layout elements. Let's substitute the two color attributes with a single text code element with only two float variables. Well, let's update this change even into vertex and pixel shaders. At this point, let's go to App Window and let's change even the vertex structure. Here, in order to introduce the texture coordinate, we have to create the vector 2D class. Let's do it. Basically, it's the same as the Vector 3D class. The only difference is that we have to remove all references to the Z value. Very well. Now let's use it in a window. As we have already seen in the introduction, the next step consists to create two separate lists, one for the positions that are vector 3D elements, and the other one is for the texture coordinates that are instead vector 2D elements.
So far so good, now we have to combine these elements into one final list, the vertex list, in such a way to reuse the same positions with different text or coordinates. The best way to organize it is in group of four tuples, where each group corresponds to a face of the cube. The first one is the front face. The second is the back, and so on in this way. We can speed up the choice of indices to use to access the elements of these lists by following the indices inside the index list that we have already added previously. At the end we have to modify the list of indices, since now the vertex list that it refers to has been changed. The modify consists to follow a simple pattern that we can notice by seeing the first two groups. The first line is a row of incremental numbers, in the second row instead we have that the first number is the repetition of the last number of the first row, the second number increments the first of one and the last number is the first number of the first row. Let's repeat this process for all the groups of indices. So far so good, now we have to go to device context and add the method that allow us to bind texture to graphics pipeline and let's call it set texture for both vertex and pixel shader. Let's implement them. The code is nearly the same as cost and buffer. The only thing here is that we don't pass directly the texture resource but a shader resource view. In DirectX 11 the same resource, like a texture, can be represented in multiple ways, as a shader resource, as a render target, and so on. In this case, we want to use a texture in our pixel shader. So, in order to do that, we have to create a shader resource representation of our texture. To do this, let's go to texture class 
And here, after the creation of our texture, let's create a shader resource view. First of all, we have to define its description. All the necessary data are all nearly available in the image data object. Well, let's come back to device context and here let's pass our newly created shader resource. In app window, let's make our wood texture an attribute of the class in order to be used even in an update method. And in on update method, let's call set texture and let's pass the pixel shader and our boot texture. The very last thing to do is to add a texture to the object in the pixel shader. And the returns one of each pixel for the usage of the sample function. Let's see if it works. And it works. But libraries haven't been released. So we have missed to release some resource. Let's go to texture 
and indeed we have missed to release the shader resource view. The next time we will deepen the usage of smart pointer used by DirectX and this way we will not have to deal with these situations. And it works, libraries has been released. The very last thing to do is to improve the usage of shade pointer in device context class. Here we are constraining the user to pass shared pointer as copy and not as reference. This involves a lot of operations and so a lot of overhead. This involves a lot of operations and so a lot of overhead that can bring us to really big bottlenecks in the future. So let's start to const reference all our shade pointers. Let's see if it works. And it works. That's all for now, folks. Today we have seen how to create a texture manager and how to load and apply a texture on a 3D cube. The next time we will talk about materials. I hope you enjoyed this video. See you soon. Thanks for watching.